Good morning, Church, and welcome once again to our online worship service at Penang Trinity. We are so glad that you have decided to join us this morning. I'm certain that God has ordained this time for us to worship and hear His Word together as a family. Whether you're joining us for the first time or for the millionth time, we welcome you to be a part of our family. If you are new to our community, do scan the QR code on our Connect form to help us stay in touch with you and keep you informed of our church events. And now let us begin our worship service by reading the scripture sentence together, taken from Psalms chapter 24, verse 1 to 4. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. For he founded it on the seas and established it on the waters. Who may ascend the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? The one who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not trust in an idol or swear by false God. Let us pray. Lord, we come to you today with a heart of thankfulness. Despite the turbulence and disruption in our world caused by the COVID-19 pandemic, we know that ultimately you are in control and you are sovereign. You made this world and you made us. We continue to trust in your protection and your healing. Bind us together, Lord, in a spirit of unity and joy as we sit at your feet to listen to your word and enable us to be true worshippers who worship in spirit and in truth. May our homes be transformed by the renewing work of your Holy Spirit. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Fair is Lord Jesus, ruler of all nature. Jesus, Lord. 
shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship Him with gladness. Acknowledge that the Lord is God. He made us and we are His. Don't 
Jesus tries to hide And trembles at his voice Trembles at his voice How great is our God Sing with me how great is our God Oh, we see how great How great Let's remain in this attitude of worship as we bring our prayers and petitions before the Lord. And the first thing we want to pray for is for Myanmar in the aftermath of a coup by the military and a year-long nationwide uh, state of emergency. Let's pray for the civilian leaders who have been detained to be protected against mistreatment. Let's also pray for a fair elections process to be restored to the nation. And let's also pray against increased violence and persecution of Rohingya during the season. Let's pray. God of all creation, we bring to you the nation of Myanmar and its people. We pray for them in this turbulent time when their attempts of establishing a stable democratic system seems to have taken a few steps back. Lord, we want to commit to you all who have been detained. Lord, we ask that they would be treated fairly. We pray that the innocent would be released from capture. We also pray for the people of Myanmar, many of whom are taking to the streets to protest against the military. We pray that you will guard them from both instigating as well as being on the receiving end of violence. We also pray for protection of ethnic groups like the Rohingya who face the threat of greater persecution. Would you be their protector in their moments of need? We pray ultimately for a peaceful resolution to all that's happening, Lord, that you will restore free and fair elections and that justice would prevail for the people of Myanmar. Lord, in your mercy, would you hear our prayers? Secondly, we want to pray for Malaysia. We want to pray for all who have lost businesses, jobs, and other sources of income due to the pandemic and the MCO. Let's also pray that God will give them hope and confidence in His provision for them. Let's pray. Father, we continue persevering in prayer for those in Malaysia who are going through financial hardship as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic and the various forms of MCO over the months. 
We pray, Lord, that your good hand of provision will sustain them, not only in physical needs, but also in mental, emotional, social, and spiritual needs. Lord, would you surround them with people who can encourage them and also help them along this difficult time. We ask, Lord, that you will hear our prayers in your mercy. Thirdly, we want to pray for our church, that our various ministries will continue meet, meeting the, the needs in this new normal of turbulence and uncertainty. Let's also pray for our ministry heads to discern God's spirit well and to follow him readily. May we pray. We lift our church, Lord, Penang Trinity, to you. We pray for our ministries and those who lead them. Lord, that they will courageously follow you wherever you may lead them during this unfamiliar time. We pray especially for those involved in the ministry of teaching for our kindergarten, our church school, our BB, our MYF, uh, baptism and membership classes, and also our pulpit. Lord, we pray that your truths would be imparted in fresh and effective ways, even as we persevere over an electronic medium and deal with related issues and challenges. Lord, in your mercy, would you hear our prayers. And lastly, we want to pray for ourselves. Let's pray that we would be continually reminded of the awesome power of our universe creating God especially in the face of personal troubles that seem so big to us. Let's pray. We pray, Lord, that you would help us to always keep your sovereign power in mind, that it would bring perspective to our lives and the challenges that we face. We pray that we would turn to you and seek your face daily so that we might enjoy the confidence and assurance of being in close fellowship with the one who orders every moment of our universe. Lord, instead of us limiting you with our limited understanding and our often wavering faith, we ask that you would expand our horizons with your vision for our lives, your vision for our church, your vision for this world that you call us to make disciples of. We pray this in the all-powerful name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Good morning and welcome to our 10 a.m. corporate worship service. As always, a joy and pleasure to see all of you connected with us, even as we worship the name of the Lord together. A big welcome for those of you who are joining us across Malaysia and also outside Malaysia as well. If you're here for the first or second time, I'd like to invite you to scan that QR code that will bring you to our online guest connect form. We'd love to hear from you and keep you updated on our church community news. We celebrate the Lord's Supper together later, and so if you have not already done so, please prepare the Holy Communion elements so that uh, we can celebrate together the Holy Communion in our individual homes. As usual, we have two e-payment channels for us to bring our offering and gifts before the Lord. Over on the left is the QR code that will bring you to Touch and Go app to make your free will offering. But if you're making your pledges or making the Holy Communion second offering, I'd like to ask you to use the Maybank account. Details are there on the right so that we can record the transaction. Even as we reflect upon the Lord's goodness and faithfulness in our lives, I'd like to bring to you our community news. The Holy Communion offering for this month will go to support the work of Malaysian Care. We saw a video last week on their ministry outreach activities and you know that they are very heavily involved with helping the urban poor, the orang asli and on advocacy uh, issues on uh, areas of uh, justice concerns in our society. We trust that the Lord will continue to move us to be generous, to support the work of his kingdom in this particular instance to the work of Malaysian care. Last month, we collected just slightly under 17,000 ringgit to support poor and needy students in Methodist Boys School and Methodist Girls School. We continue to be amazed of how God has moved his people here in this community to be generous at a time such as this uh, to help the disadvantaged around us. And we trust that the Lord will continue to work powerfully in our midst to be generous 
to those who are in need. On behalf of MYF, we want to thank all of you who supported uh, the recent initiative to raise funds uh, for the House of Hope. A lot of you stepped forward and uh, I'm sure you're enjoying the cookies even right now. And uh, we want to commend the youth for their um, initiative, for their heart, for those who are in need around them. And we pray that we continue to serve the work of the kingdom together. Lent season is uh, going to happen soon. And this will be, of course, a time of prayerful devotion. To help us guide through our devotions, the track board of worship has come up with the Land Meditation Guide. Our church office has ordered 40 physical copies of this. Of course, during the MCO, we are unable to go physically to the church office. But if you are interested to receive a physical hard copy of the Land Meditation Guide, please let the church office know or email any of the church leaders. We'll make arrangements to get the physical copy delivered to you. As a reminder, we'll be having a special uh, church plan and budget presentation later, right after the corporate worship service. I hope you have uh, taken the opportunity to um, pre-register yourself for this special Zoom session where A Hong and myself will wait, be waiting for you later uh, to interact with you, even as we share the church plan and budgets uh, to you. So see you later, just after the church uh, worship service this morning. On behalf of the pastor, Reverend Shen, and all of our LCEC leaders, I'll take this opportunity to wish you a happy and blessed Chinese New Year. Obviously, very different this year and how we celebrate uh, the New Year uh, in our own individual homes and maybe, who knows, with virtual and electronic armpouse. But the best of all, God is with us. And God's faithfulness and unfailing love is still active among us. And we wish you the Lord's grace and his love and blessing upon you and your family this Chinese New Year. Right now, let's unite our hearts to worship the Lord together through the doxology. reading is taken from the book of Genesis chapter 1 verse 1 to chapter 2 verse 3. Reading from chapter 1 verse 1. In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep and the spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. God saw that the light was good and he separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning the first day. And God said, Let there be a vault between the waters to separate water from water. So God made the vault and separated the water under the vault from the water above it. And it was so. God called the vault sky, and there was evening, and there was morning the second day. And God said, Let the water under the sky be gathered to one place, and let dry ground appear. And it was so. God called dry ground land, and gathered waters he called seas. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, Let the land produce vegetation, seed bearing plants and trees, on land that bear fruit with it according to their various kinds. And it was so. The land produced vegetation, plants bearing seed according to their kinds, and trees bearing fruit received in it according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening, and there was morning the third day. And God said, 
Let there be lights in the vault of the sky to separate the day from the night, and let them serve as signs to mark scattered times and the days and years, and let them be lights in the vault of the sky to give light on the earth. And it was so. God made two great lights, the greater light to govern the day and the lesser light to govern the night. He also made the stars. God set them in the vault of the sky to give light on the earth, to govern the day and the night, and to separate light from darkness. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening, and there was morning the fourth day. And God said, Let the water teem with living creatures, and let birds fly above the earth across the vault of the sky. So God created the great creatures of the sea and every living thing with which the water teems and that moves about in it according to their kinds, and every wink bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. God blessed them and said, Be fruitful and increase in numbers, and fill the water in the seas, and let the birds increase on the earth. And there was evening, and there was morning the fifth day. And God said, Let the land produce living creatures according to their kinds, livestock, the creatures that move along the ground, and the wild animals, each according to its kind. And it was so. God made the wild animals according to their kinds, the livestock according to their kinds, and all the creatures that move along the ground according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let us make mankind in our own image, in our own, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in numbers. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Then God said, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it. They will be yours for food. And to all the beasts on the earth and all the birds in the skies, and all the creatures that move along the ground. Everything that has breath of life in it, I give you every green plant for food, and it was so. God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. And it was evening, and it was morning, the sixth day. Reading on to chapter 2, verse 1. Thus the heavens and earth were completed in all their vast array. By the seventh day, God has finished the work he has been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. Then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it he rested from all the work creating that he had done. This is the word of the Lord. Let's come to the Lord in prayer. Let's pray. Father, we want to ask that you help us to seek your truth. Well, we pray that you will unpack it for us whatever you want to communicate to us for the sake of uh, living lives that are more pleasing to you. Lord, may you do your transforming work through your Holy Spirit. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, before Darth Vader, there was Anakin Skywalker. Before the Fellowship of the Ring and their journey to Mordor, there were the adventures of the Hobbit, Bilbo Baggins. And before every superhero career is a story of who they used to be and how they got their powers. Now, there's just something very fascinating about origin stories. Uh, there's something about understanding where people came from and who they used to be that helps us to better understand and appreciate who they are now and how they got there. Now, today we're embarking on a new sermon series on the origin story of all humankind. We're looking at the book of Genesis. And Genesis is a big book, 50 chapters in total. So we'll be doing expository preaching on the book of Genesis 
all the way into sometime in the end of October. So if you've never tried reading the Bible from cover to cover before, you're going to read through and hopefully have a better understanding on the whole book of Genesis as long as you are with us every Sunday for the next nine months. And after we're done with Genesis, we'll switch tracks to uh, a New Testament book and we'll look at one of Paul's letters, uh, his letter to the Ephesians. So, the book of Genesis. Now, the word Genesis means the origins of something. But the original Hebrew, for, Hebrew word for the, the name of this book, the title of this book, is Bereshit. And that literally means in the beginning. And so the, the first word of the Hebrew Bible is Bereshit, in the beginning. So although the book has a, a whole range of different events, characters, and topics, the book is mainly about the beginning. But the beginning of what? Well, it's the beginning of everything. Uh, but we can do two main subdivisions for the book of Genesis. The first chunk of text, the first part, uh, from chapter 1 to chapter 11 is an account of the origins of the world and humankind as we know it, uh, primeval history. The second chunk of text is uh, from chapter 12 to 50, and that's an account of the origins of the people of Israel, okay, ancestral history. Now, the author of Genesis uh, has long thought to be Moses, according to Jewish tradition, uh, of course, there are modern scholars that challenge that. In fact, modern scholars challenge almost everything. <laughs> uh, but there's no real reason to disbelieve that God revealed all the contents of Genesis to Moses to record for Israel's uh, reference and our knowledge. Now, in terms of genre, the book of Genesis mainly cycles between genealogies, okay, uh, this guy is the father of that guy who is the father of this guy who is the father of that guy, uh, and historical narratives, which is basically the, the telling of a sequence of events. So today we are looking mostly at chapter 1 uh, into the first part of chapter 2, which is a narrative of the very beginning of everything, and it's uh, pretty much the first seven days of all of creation. And the big idea for today is that God created everything to be good. Okay, so if you forget everything, this is the one thing to remember. God created everything to be good. Now, for today's passage, there are quite a few things that we can draw from it. Uh, for example, mankind being created in God's image. You know, but we, we just covered uh, quite a bit of that recently, uh, a couple of weeks back. Uh, so today I'd like for us to narrow our focus to three functions that today's passage performs. And firstly, it functions as a historical account. Now the historicity of the first chapters of Genesis is a major stumbling block for many people who struggle to believe in the existence of God. Many apologetic debates revolve around the accuracy of Genesis as a historical account. Uh, many people believe that it's you know it's not actual history and it's more of a story. It's a myth, you know that sort of thing. Uh, it's not just uh, atheists and agnostics that have trouble with Genesis. Christians also struggle with it. Many Christians struggle with you know how do you interpret Genesis chapter one, for example? Did God create our earth in six literal days, six twenty-four hour days, uh, or? or so, you know, six literal days, meaning that our Earth is probably about 6,000 years old. Or did God uh, create the, the, the whole world in, in six day ages, where each day represents an age, uh, an indeterminate length of time, could be millions of years for each day, you know, which one is it? Uh, was the Big Bang part of God's process in creation? Uh, what about dinosaurs? What about Neanderthals? You know, does Darwin's evolution theory fit? Uh, did Genesis inspire Mesopotamian mythology? Or did God reveal to the Babylonians a, a story that shared quite a few similarities? And so on and so forth. 
Now, the reason why all these questions remain is because we simply don't know the answers conclusively. Uh, despite all our advancements of science, technology, and even our growing wealth of readily accessible knowledge, the beginning of the world is beyond scientific observation. It's beyond historical eyewitness record. Okay, even what we learn in school, you know, that the Earth is billions of years old, that, that's all based on the assumption that carbon dating continues to be accurate even when there is insufficient radiocarbon you know, after an object is beyond uh, thousands of years old. So we, we can't use traditional scientific method to determine conclusively the beginning of the world and the universe as we know it. But beginning with what we can prove and what we can understand is the wrong place when it comes to God. Uh, well, yes, there is a place for apologetic reasoning, but you know, that's not, uh, this is not it. Today is not it. This morning, we gather as a people of faith. And so, as a people of faith, our starting point is the same as the starting point of everything else in existence. It all begins with God, who was just there. <laughs> okay? uh, God was not created. Uh, how did God come about? He's God. He was there. Okay, And so since we begin with God, let's firstly establish one of his attributes. Now, if you look at Genesis chapter 1, you can count the number of times when it says, And God said, Let there be something. Okay, And this is repeated eight times. And God said, Let there be light. And God said, Let there be veggie. You know, and all that. And if you count also in Genesis chapter 1, you can count the number of times it says, and it was so. Okay? And this is a total of five times. And so God says, uh, and God said, let there be something, and it was so. Okay? So it came about. And so this is known as uh, creatio ex nihilo, okay? which is Latin, basically creating out of nothing. And God is speaking things into existence out of nothing. And that's very different from what we do when we create. You see, when we say that we create as humans, what we're really doing is we are repurposing or we are rearranging something. We fashion tools out of raw materials. So, for example, I take a stone and I bang, 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 and then eventually the, the stone resembles a certain shape that I can use as a cutting tool for example. Uh, and, and so we use these tools to do something to other types of raw materials. And so if you think about it, technology is really just building upon something that has been building upon something else, you know, again and again and again and again. So if you had all the knowledge and skill in the world, hypothetically, and you, you know, travel back in time with knowing exactly how to build everything, uh, you could technically build an iPhone from scratch in the first century, uh, provided you had enough time to source the necessary raw materials to build the things that you need to help you build the iPhone eventually. Not easy, not very efficient, but possible, technically. But my point is, humans cannot create something out of nothing. Only God can do that. And so this is what God does at creation. And the things he creates, he creates everything in existence. So, look around you at this very moment, okay? Fix your eyes on something. Maybe it's a screen, maybe it's a wall, maybe it's a floor, uh, maybe it's the person next to you, whatever. The thing that you're looking at right now, God created that. Okay, look at something else. He created that as well. Even if your eyes are closed and you're just staring into the back of your head, guess what? God also created that. And so God isn't just a creative God. He is omnipotent. Okay? He is all-powerful. That's what that word means. If he can create whole galaxies and worlds and all his inhabitants and systems out of nothing, then absolutely nothing is beyond his ability. So just something for us to ponder. If God is omnipotent, then can't he create the world in six literal days? 
know, even if it doesn't follow the established order of physics and chemistry and biology, as we understand. Uh, I'm not saying there's no room for the possibility of uh, a day-age creation order that happened over millions of years. But if you believe in God, and you believe that He is all-powerful, then you must also believe that He can very well have done a, a literal six-day creation process if he wanted. And if you believe that a literal six-day creation process is possible, then you must also believe that no financial trouble or health issue or broken relationship or character flaw or addiction or emotional struggle that you are going through is impossible for God to fix, to transform or to redeem. So friends, remember our God is an all-powerful God. If He can create the universe uh, with our problems and our, the things that cause us such distress and stress, uh, wet, wet water to Him. Okay, sub, sub, sorry. Nothing to Him. He is able to, to help us in every way. It's just a matter of whether it's the right time or whether it's the right thing to do at that point. Uh, let's look at our next point. And that is Genesis chapter 1 is a prelude to the gospel message. Uh, we can see one of the foundational pieces of the gospel message in today's passage. And so is this phrase that is repeated many times in chapter 1 alone. Seven times you can see these words repeated. And God saw that it was good. Okay? And God saw that it was good. And so this is actually following up from the the previous two groups of repetitions that I mentioned. And God said, let there be something. And it was so, and God saw that it was good. Okay, so this, it, this God seeing that it was good, this sets the baseline for the gospel message and the entire history of redemption. Because everything that God created was good including mankind and womankind. Everything that God created was good. And so this is the picture of perfection. We'll see next week in chapter 2 uh, about perfection being localized in a place known as Eden. But for today, we're just talking generally that God created everything good. And so that is the starting place for the gospel because uh, before you need all the redemption and all that, it starts with, uh, before you look at the problem, we, we see the starting point, that everything was good, including our relationship with God. Now, sometimes it's hard for us to imagine that God is a good God because of, you know, of for all our entire lives, uh, for all of recorded history, sin and the effects of sin were always present. In fact, you can't even read the, the other 99% of the Bible without coming across sin and its effects on the world and mankind. And so since sin is so familiar to us, we have a tendency to project sinful imperfections on to God. Okay? And so we, we project onto Him our own uh, ideas of a sinful earthly father or a sinful family member or a sinful friend or a sinful authority figure and we imagine him to be spiteful, to be unloving, to be stingy, to be unfair, to be calculative. You know, that's because that's always been our experiences with ourselves and our friends and our family and total strangers all around the world because we all sin. And the effects of sin can be seen not just in humanity, but all of creation. Death, decay, disease, all of creation is tainted by sin. But God is absolutely good. And He desires always the good of all that He created. And so in keeping with His good character, He created everything to be absolutely good. The danger of animals, plants, and the rest of nature, their ability to harm us, to kill us, none of that was present before sin entered this world. And mankind and their ability to hurt and harm and cause immense pain and suffering, 
none of that was present before sin entered this world. And so just like how you can tell a tree by its fruit, God's good creation matches his good character. You see, God's good character, you can infer that his creation was good. Sorry, uh, if you see that God created everything good, yeah, you can infer that his character is good. And so we saw previously one of God's foundational attributes, his omnipotence. Nothing is impossible for him. Now we see another foundational attribute, his goodness, which can be synonymous with his holiness. And so if we believe that this all-powerful God is also perfectly good and desires the good of all, then we can also be reassured that when we experience the effects of sin, when we go through difficulties, when we suffer, we know it's not because you know, God is unable to do anything to change the situation because he is all-powerful. And yet at the same time, we know that it's not because God doesn't care about us or that he wants us to suffer because we know that he is good. So we have a problem here. If God is all-powerful and he is good, then why do we still experience difficulty and suffering and all that? What's the conclusion? The conclusion is something that we probably don't want to hear. And that is, God, in his infinite wisdom, has a good plan for us that we cannot see and we cannot understand. Uh, we don't like this answer because it sounds like a copper answer. Uh, we also don't like it because uh, we are not in control because we can't, uh, we can't see it coming and all that. But that's the thing about God being God. He alone is God. We are not. So we need to just trust Him to not only be all-powerful, but also to be perfectly good and just continually, faithfully live out that trust in Him. And so the, the story of God's redemption of mankind, uh, in, in this story, you can think of Genesis chapter 1 and 2, the, the first two chapters of Genesis, as a bookend, okay? And Revelation 22 as the other bookend. You know, a bookend is the, you have a shelf full of books, right? And if you don't put anything at the end, the, the last book is going to topple, and then the next few. Right? And so bookends are things that you put at the end of books. Wow, I know, right? And they hold the books up upright. And so you can think of Genesis chapter 1 and 2 as one bookend, Revelation 22 as another bookend. And all the books in between is a record of all of history, all of history that is tainted by sin but being redeemed by the sacrificial work of Jesus on the cross. But at these bookends, the very beginning and the very end, Genesis chapter 1 and 2 and Revelation 22, everything is good. Now let's move on to the third function that I want to highlight from today's passage. And that is there is a case for the Trinity. Now, although the words Jesus and, and Holy Spirit are not mentioned in this chapter, this is the first place in scripture where we come across the concept of the Trinity. That God is one God, but at the same time, he's three persons, okay, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Uh, so if you see the diagram uh, right now, God the Father is God the Son, is God the Holy Spirit, but at the same time, uh, God the Father is not God the Son, is not God the Holy Spirit. Okay, so three distinct persons, yet the same God. You know, so one of those things that we, we cannot understand fully because we have no mortal version of it. Now, in our English translations, we see the word God as a singular noun, right? There's no S at the end. So God, singular, one God. But in the original Hebrew, the word for God, the Hebrew word for God is Elohim, okay? And this is a plural word. It's a plural form for the word God. 
And so directly translated, it would mean gods. In fact, it is used in uh, other parts of, of the Bible uh, to be translated as idols, okay? Gods, small g. Uh, before you think uh, that, you know, the Bible is talking about a pantheon of gods involved in creation, you know, actually we, we are, we are worshipping many gods and all this while, you know, the, the verb that follows this subject noun of Elohim is in the singular form. What do I mean by this? You see, in Hebrew, verbs have pronouns attached to them. Okay? Pronouns are he, she, it. Okay? So, for example, Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 in English is, in the beginning, God created. Right? The original Hebrew would have been uh, Bereshit bara Elohim. Okay? Which literally translates as, in the beginning, he created, singular, God's plural okay uh, doesn't mean that he created gods uh, in english uh, hebrew word placement structure is very weird so you must think like yoda the ballet a bit okay uh, and so basically what it means is in the beginning god plural created singular okay now some scholars have argued that this style of referring to a single person in the plural form is used to refer to royalty. But that isn't really consistent with other writings from that part of the world during the period of Genesis, uh, when, when it would have been written sometime around the 1400s BC, during the period of the Exodus. So when God says in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, this collective us and our is a clear reference to the Trinity. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are all present at the same time. Uh, where do we... Okay, when, when we think of creation, we typically think of God the Father, right? Doing all that. Uh, where is the Holy Spirit? Where is Jesus? Well, we see the Holy Spirit mentioned in verse 2. Chapter 1, verse 2. The Spirit of God ho is hovering over the waters. Okay? The Spirit of God is the Holy Spirit. And when it comes to Jesus, uh, although his name is not explicitly mentioned in Genesis chapter 1, uh, if you look at other parts of the Bible, so remember we need to read the Bible cohesively, okay? Other parts of the Bible inform and, and shed light on other parts. Uh, if you look at John chapter 1 verse 3, Hebrews chapter 1 verse 2, Hebrews chapter 1 verse 10, these verses all talk about Jesus being involved in the work of creation. So, he is there, he is present in the beginning, and he is involved in the work of creation together with God the Father and God the Holy Spirit. So, in case you've been thinking all this while that Jesus uh, only came into existence when he was born through the Virgin Mary, uh, no, not true. He existed even before creation, John chapter 17 informs us of that. So Jesus, that's known as the, the pre-existence uh, of Jesus. Okay, so Jesus existed. Uh, God the Son already existed. We don't know exactly what form, you know, was it, did he look identical to his human form after he was born? Don't know. But anyway, uh, Present at creation, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, the Trinity. So friends, whenever you worship our Creator God, you are worshipping a triune God. Okay? One God in three persons. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. All equally uh, important, all equally worthy of worship. In conclusion, I'd like you to know that God created everything good, in the beginning, absolutely everything was good in the beginning before sin tainted the world. I'd like you to be assured that our Creator God is a good God. He has your best interests at heart. He is good. And I'd like you to do put your hope and your trust in our all-powerful triune God. You can trust Him to uh, to do anything uh, that is right 
for your situation in his time. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now coming to some reflection and discussion questions for you to consider over the week. First question, which part of the creation story challenges you the most and why? Second question, contrast how everything was created good with the fallen state of creation today. What differences stand out the most to you? So, how everything was created good compared to everything now is clearly not perfectly good. Uh, what are the differences that stand out the most to you? And thirdly, what is one area of your life right now where you can trust our good and all-powerful triune God more? Which area of your life right now can you trust God who is good and all-powerful more? Okay, I leave these questions with you for your consideration and discussion. Friends, as it is our yearly tradition, what we do is we bring our LCEC, our local church executive committee members, to install them and dedicate them before the congregation uh, every year. And so this year, owing to the, the MCO and the pandemic and all that, we are doing an online installation. Okay, so we have all our LCEC members here and uh, they, we will be doing this installation virtually. Later, there will be a section for you to, as the congregation to respond. So make sure wherever you are, uh, you also respond out loud accordingly, okay? Uh, you may feel a little weird responding into thin air without anyone around you, but you know God is hearing us together, lah, making that pledge together. Okay, let me introduce the LCEC members to you now. First, we have our LCEC chairperson for this is all for the year 2021, uh, Mr. Daniel Ku. Our lay leader, Mr. Tan Chong Jin. Our church treasurer, Mr. Ling Lek Chen. Our church school superintendent, Mrs. Ruth Tay. The captain of our first Penang BB company, Boys Brigade Company, Leong. Our Methodist Senior Fellowship President, Mr. Tan Kok Wat. Our Methodist Women President, Mrs. Angela Kong. Our Christian Education Chairperson, Dr. Chang Chi Jia. Our Membership and Evangelism Chairperson, Mr. Daniel Ku. Our Property Management Chairperson, Mr. Lim Pang Kwan. Our Social Concerns Chairperson, Mrs. Cheng Jae Lee. Our Stewardship and Finance Chairperson, Mr. Yi A. Hong. Our Worship and Music Chairperson, Mrs. Jane Ku. Our Small Groups Coordinator, Mrs. Lim Lim Ling. And our missions chairperson, Ms. Melissa Krishnan. We also have our lay delegate, one of our lay delegates, Mr. Sia Portion. And elective stewards, Mr. Tan Siu Jin. Mr. Shane Tan, who is also the information technology chair. And Mrs. Lee Wei Lin, who is also the kindergarten chair. Okay? So friends, these are the LCEC members for 2021 and uh, just as you have seen their faces, don't just go up to them when there are problems with their respective, uh, their respective portfolios. Uh, do also encourage them and remember to keep them in prayer throughout the year. Okay. Now the charge to all the members of the LCEC here, dear brothers and sisters, you have been called by God and chosen by the people of God for leadership in Trinity Methodist Church, Penang. This ministry is a blessing and a serious responsibility. It recognizes your special gifts and it calls you to work among us and for us. In love, we thank you for accepting your obligation and challenge you to offer your best to the Lord, to this people and also 
to our ministry in the world. And so may you live a life in Christ and make him known in your witness and your work. And so now, would you please respond? Do you this day acknowledge yourself a faithful disciple of Jesus Christ? Together. Thank you. Thank you. So, will you devote yourself to the service of God in the world? Will you so live that you enable this church to be a people of love and peace? I will. And will you do all in your power to be responsible to the task for which you have been chosen? I will. Let us pray. Almighty God, pour out your blessings on these your servants who have been given particular ministries in your church. Grant them grace to give themselves wholeheartedly in your service. Keep them before the example of our Lord, who did not think first of himself, but gave himself for us all. Let them share his ministry and consecration, that they may enter into his joy. Guide them in their work. Reward their faithfulness with the knowledge that through them your purposes are accomplished through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And so, dear brothers and sisters of Trinity Methodist Church Penang, I commend to you these persons who have this day dedicated themselves as members of the local church executive committee of Trinity Methodist Church Penang. Do all that you can to help and encourage these, your leaders, in their various responsibilities, giving them at all times your cooperation, your counsel, and your prayers. And so, would the congregation please respond together? We rejoice to recognize these persons as leaders of our church. We will help and encourage them in their various responsibilities into which they have now been called, giving them at all times our cooperation, our counsel, and our prayers. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Friends, we continue with the commissioning of our small group leaders. And so, I just want to introduce to you the following people who are the leaders of our various small groups. Firstly, we have Mr. Cheng Giam Liang, but he is not able to join us today. So, he is being represented by his wife, Jay Lee. We have Mr. Chan Chen Weng. Dr. Ku Chok Kao. Mr. Daniel Ku. Uh, Mr. Jesse Ong is also unable to join us. He sends his apologies. Uh, next, we have Dr. Chang Chi Jia. And Mr. Jason Cheng. Mr. Tan Kok Huat. Dr. So Kim Guan. Mrs. Lim Lim Ling Mr. Xia Portion Mr. Hendrix Chong Mr. Tevin Lee together with his wife Wilin and Madam Tan So Lee Mrs. Sabrina Lee Miss Melissa Krishnan and Mr. Mark Ngai Leong. Okay, so friends, those are our small group leaders uh, for this year. And just want to remind you that if you know of anyone who is not in a small group, you can direct them to any of these people. And uh, also do remember to keep them in prayer throughout this year. Okay? Now we continue with the order. So to the congregation, dear friends, the office of class leader is one of the most important contributions made by World Methodism to the pastoral leadership of Christ's Holy Church. In the general rules of 1743, 
John Wesley described the Methodist societies as companies of men and women who, having the form and seeking the power of godliness, come together in order to pray, to receive the word of exhortation, and to watch over one another in love that they may help each other work out their salvation. To this end, the societies were divided into small companies called classes, each with an appointed leader to advise, reprove, comfort, or exhort as occasion may require. And so small group leaders of today continue this tradition of class leaders. In the founding discipline of our church, they are described as persons not only of sound judgment, but truly devoted to God. And they are willing to help others in the congregation to grow in the knowledge and love of God. And so to all the small group leaders here and various representatives, do you accept the position of small group leader in Trinity Methodist Church, Penang? Together? I do. I do. Will you exercise this position by helping other members of the congregation to fulfill the general rule of discipleship? to witness to Jesus Christ in the world and to follow his teachings through acts of compassion, justice, worship, and devotion under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. I I will. Will. will you help other members of the congregation to be accountable for their discipleship, not by judging them, but by watching over them in love? I will. I will. 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 Will you meet regularly in covenant with others of like mind and purpose to be accountable for your own discipleship? I will. Thank you, small group leaders. Now to the rest of the congregation, uh, res do respond out loud together, okay? So will you affirm the call of these men and women to be small group leaders in Trinity Methodist Church Penang together we will will you acknowledge them as your leaders in discipleship and accept their guidance as they watch over you in love we will now to the small group leaders you are hereby commissioned as small group leaders in Trinity Methodist Church Penang let us pray most gracious God, bless your servants whom we now entrust with the position of small group leader. Grant them wisdom tempered by your love and courage tempered by your justice so that Jesus Christ might be honoured and served by all in this congregation to the furtherance of your coming reign on earth as in heaven through the same Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Come to a time of communion and once again I want to remind you that if you have not already uh, gotten your elements ready of uh, bread or crackers and juice uh, please do do that now. Uh, we come to the invitation to the Lord's table. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Let us pray the prayer of confession and pardon together. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbours and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let's spend some moments in quiet confession and repentance before the Lord. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners and that proves God's love towards us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. 
At this time, we want to offer one another signs of God's peace and reconciliation and love. And so I encourage you, just turn to those next to you if you're worshipping together with uh, other people. and Just extend the hand of peace to them. And uh, those of you who are uh, participating in this worship uh, alone, I encourage you to just type in the chat uh, and wish somebody the peace of the Lord be with them. God's peace be with you. Uh, this time we typically collect the offering. Um, and, and so, once again, I just want to remind you that the, the Maybank account number has already been flashed up on the screen uh, during the announcements time. And uh, your offering will go, make sure that when you, when you transfer, you indicate that this offering is for the poor and needy. Okay, so as forgiven and reconciled people, let us offer ourselves and our gifts to God. You may do this now if you're really quick or maybe later after service. Let's continue with the great thanksgiving. The Lord be with you and also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn together. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ, by the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection. You gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which Jesus gave himself up for us, he took bread, he gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, when the supper was over, he took the cup, he gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us, as we proclaim the mystery of faith together. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. And so Lord, may you pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory, and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit and your holy church, all honour and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now with the confidence of children of God, let us pray the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Friends, the head of the household uh, may distribute the elements now. The body of Jesus Christ given for you. Take and eat. Remember Jesus who died for you.
in the blood of Jesus Christ shed for you, for the forgiveness of sins, drink in remembrance of him. O oh Lord my God, when I'm in awesome wonder, consider all the worlds I hand and made. I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe displayed. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to me. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to me. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. God, His Son, not sparing, sent Him to die. I scarce can take it in. That on the cross, my burden gladly bearing, He bled and died to take away my sin. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to me. Shouts of acclamation and take me home. What joy shall fill my heart? Then I shall bow in humble adoration and there proclaim, My God, how great you are! Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee. receive the Lord's benediction. We have gathered here today, Lord God, as your people, to offer you our sacrifice of prayer and worship. We have fed on your word. We have been refreshed through your living water. We have felt the encircling of your spirit around this fellowship and around individual lives. As we go from this service, may we continue 
to know your presence and power in the very different lives that we lead to your praise and glory. And so may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you always. Amen. The threefold Amen together. Amen. 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 Friends, thank you for joining us in this service. Uh, we pray that you would have a very blessed week ahead. Just a, a little quick reminder for those of you who have already registered for the budget presentation. Uh, please be reminded that uh, we'll be meeting later at the Zoom link that will be provided to you at 11.15 a.m. Okay, I'll see you there. And for those of you who would like to be prayed for, please click on the ministry link and I'll be happy to pray for you and with you. Okay, God bless. See you again next week.